this evening we have a little light literature here. But I gave you a break. I only brought the first volume. Uh, this work, which was published, the first volume, in 1677, and the second volume, a few years later, may be described as the fountainhead of our literature of Kabbalism. The author was a very profound scholar, Christian Knorr, Baron von Rosenroth. He was a university professor and not Jewish, but Christian. Yet with this background, he became profoundly interested in what has been called the secret doctrine in Israel. He was certainly a man born before his time, for during the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, the very subject of the Kabbalah was not only not frequently mentioned among Jewish people, but almost never outside of a small group of very scholarly rabbis. Even in our present century, the subject is a highly controversial one. I've had the distinction and pleasure of upsetting considerable part of an orthodox Jewish congregation by reference to this subject. They rushed immediately to the rabbi and then a trouble broke. However, in the last 20 years, the entire attitude of the scholarly world has changed. Perhaps our increasing interest in psychology had something to do with it, for in Kabbalism we had another one of those archetypal patterns of human ideas which are concerning us more and more. Perhaps also the rise of Zionism had something to do with it. In any event, at the present time, that uh, learned, infallible source of information, the Encyclopedia Britannica, observes that all 19th century and earlier appraisals of Kabbalism must be entirely re-evaluated. By this we mean, and they mean, that the negative position taken earlier is no longer held to be sound. At the present time, at least two groups, one in Germany and one in Israel, are working to restore the neglected fragments of Kabbalistic literature. Manuscripts are being sought out collected, placed at the disposal of scholars, and the modern tendency is to view the Kabbalah much as the Jewish people have viewed the Dead Sea Scrolls, as a relic of the past that may be of immediate value in solving basic problems, not only of Jewish sociology, but of the relationships between the Jewish and non-Jewish worlds. Von Rosenroth was aware of this. He sensed it long ago. He knew that this very mysterious subject was deep, was important, but like most of the scholars of his time, he was unable to cope with it in a complete manner. Individuals who knew much less than he did have therefore risen as his critics, complaining about minor errors of translation and uh, worrying about the possible alternative meanings of carefully worded phrases. But in spite of this picking process, which has so long attempted to 
discredit honest scholarship. His volumes remain as the great monument, for they signify the first real effort to use Kabbalism to bridge the interval between Jewish and non-Jewish thinking. Up to the time of von Rosenroth, practically all of the Kabbalistic literature was in Jewish only. And uh, the non-Jewish European society had no particular interest in this literature. In fact, they were really afraid of it. It became involved in a great many rather unsavory legends and was finally regarded by orthodox non-Jewish people as perhaps some form of Satanism uh, endangering the morality of the virtuous. But now that these older clouds have passed from the horizon, we are interested in trying to understand one of the most confusing, perplexing, and austere of all concepts of life. I suppose the only uh, parallel work in obscurity is the Chinese volume, the Yi Ging, or Classic of Changes. And in many respects the two works are similar. Both deal with extremely obscure metaphysical concepts. Both have a tremendous traditional antiquity, and both have survived to this time, much to the wonder and even consternation of scholars. Within the last 15 or 20 years, however, the Yi Ging has become of interest far outside the boundaries of China. And the interest of the Jungian psychologists in the Chinese classic of changes may possibly indicate that in the future men of similar minds will uh, begin to explore uh, the recondite side of the Kabbalah. We really know very little about the antiquity of this work. Um, we know that it was first circulated in Europe about the year 1305. At that time, the principal exponent was Rabbi Moses of Leon. And for a long time, it was assumed that he had fabricated the great Kabbalistic book, the Sefa HaZohar, or the Book of the Splendors. It was just taken for granted that he had fabricated and manufactured the entire work. More recently, however, it became obvious that if he did, he was perhaps the most extraordinary mind in history. It became easier to assume that this man, who though brilliant was not exceptional, had secured his information elsewhere. It just became too large a subject uh, to be encompassed within the life and ability of one person. Rabbi Moses was a very busy man. His life was fairly well known. There was not much possibility that a work of the magnitude of the Zohar could have been produced by him without others knowing about the processes. He would certainly have had to call upon rare reference material and things of that nature. And this was not apparently the direction of his life at all. So perhaps it would be wiser to assume that his own idea, his own statement at the time, was reasonably valid. Namely, that the work had come into his possession in manuscript form as part of the unwritten or unpublished, we'll say, legacy of Israel. In other words, that it was a work long secretly known, passed in rare copy from one great scholar to another, and that it finally came to his conviction that it should be brought together and made available to the world. To explain the origin of the work, Rabbi Moses uh, ben Leon therefore took the attitude or held forth the belief that is more or less contained within the text itself, 
that the original author was a Rabbi Simeon ben Yokoi, a man who uh, wrote the work or compiled it under inspiration about the year 161 A.D. during the reign of the Roman uh, Caesar Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Uh, this Rabbi Simeon was a mystic. Uh, to escape Roman persecution, he went into the wilderness and lived in a cave. And here for many years, he was supposed to have received mystical experiences, forms of illumination. The prophets of old came to him. He received instruction from the angelic hosts that are referred to in the uh, Pentateuch. As a result of this great length of time in isolation in this cave, he gradually wrote down or transcribed this mystic doctrine. However, of course, the Rabbi Simeon did not himself claim that he invented the idea. He did not invent the Kabbalah, nor is it actually de demonstrable that he was the first to write on the subject in ancient times. Actually, I think we will have to assume that the Kabbalah more or less accumulated. And all of this accumulation did not take place within the body of ancient Jewry itself. The moment we begin to investigate the subject, uh, we come upon a number of rather interesting possibilities. The date 161 A.D. may be comparatively correct for an important revelation by compilation of certain doctrines that were available in the Near East at that time. The actual structure of the Kabbalah shows that it is profoundly indebted to Gnosticism, the sect that was flourishing at that time in North Africa and in parts of Syria, a sect which has come again into prominence in recent years from the discovery of the great Gnostic library at Chenobaskian in central Egypt. Uh, the Gnostics taught a doctrine of emanations as a means of reconciling the Creator as an abstract principle, God, and the creation as a concrete structure. Uh, the problem of bridging between deity in its universal and mystical sense and the formal universe this problem was one of the great problems of Gnosticism, and uh, it is also one of the essential elements in the great Kabbalistic system. Also at this time, we must remember that Mahayana Buddhism was rising in India, perhaps had already risen. And this conveys another important element, which perhaps had been generally neglected in the Near East, and therefore was felt to be necessary in the unfoldment of Jewish religion. Uh, the Kabbalah, for example, deals with a basic problem of the difference between transcendence and imminence. Transcendence in this sense means the transcendence of God. Jewish religion had, orthodoxly speaking, created a God above and superior to the world. This deity uh, rested eternally above the world and the planets and beyond the grasp and contact of living things. Seated on its eternal throne, it was an absolute despot over creation. This distant, all-powerful God, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, uh, was scarcely the concept of deity most useful to the Jewish people during the Roman captivity. 
uh, the Jewish Empire kingdom was gone. These people had received a tremendous spiritual disaster into themselves. This, the, this disaster undermined faith. It undermined the old way of life. It seemed to cry out that God had forgotten Israel. It seemed as though there was too much of punishment and not enough of forgiveness in the divine nature. This God of powers and glories, this El Shaddad the Strong, was not the type of deity that could comfort a sick, forlorn, and miserable scattered people. Something nearer, something more immediate to their lives was very necessary to them. There is really no doubt in the world that this was also one of the mainsprings of Christianity which arose in the same general area and also came to a people weary and disillusioned and tired. Uh, this sense of Christian immediacy certainly profoundly affected the religions of the West, especially through the Christology of St. Paul. So it is quite possible that Mahayana Buddhism which had this uh, tremendous emphasis upon the immediacy of spiritual authority, that it was not something infinitely remote, but something infinitely available. The deity was not far away always, not looking down from an omnipotence upon a tired world, but that in some way deity was here. Deity was therefore imminent. It was available at any moment to be reached, to be understood in some measure, uh, to bestow its consolation uh, upon the suffering heart and the broken pride and the tortured soul. This Mahayana Buddhism uh, accomplished in connection with classical Buddhism, which was the rather austere doctrine that Gautama gave the world. This doctrine of Gautama was also too transcendent for the average Hindu to live by. He needed this softening, gentle touch. He needed this doctrine of the Bodhisattvas, the wonderful beings who with their great ears listened forever to the sorrows of men, who were always available through prayer, and uh, who interceded with the universe as consolers of human sorrow. The church fell somewhat into this same problem, and from it instinctively, patterning upon older peoples, Christianity developed its doctrine of saints and the doctrine of intercession, by which the individual in his spiritual need was able to bridge the interval between humanity and divine help. So we have in Kabbalism this arising among a people previously almost completely deficient in this particular attitude, almost uh, entirely uh, lost in a strange spiritual austerity, something perhaps suggestive of Brahmanism, something suggestive of the wonderful, deep, but incomprehensible wisdom of the universal power itself. Men could not live entirely supported only by the belief that God was wise. They had to also experience the fact that God was good, that God was love, that God was ever-present help in time of trouble. It therefore would seem reasonable that during the difficult periods in Jewish history, a number of sects should arise, like the Gebas of Hebron, the Nazarites, and the Essenes, who were to emphasize uh, this 
phase of the divine presence, that not only to the great scholar, the learned master of the Sanhedrin, would this spiritual presence of God be known, but also to just ordinary people who could reach deity in some inward experience of their own. While uh, the old Jewish system did not emphasize such intercession, it was to a measure present, at least archetypally, in their beliefs. For the system of Jewish prophets is almost unique in the religious literature of the world. These men of the wilderness and in the desert these comparatively uncouth persons who dared to rise up in the presence of kings and threaten the wrath of God upon the unbeliever or the disobedient, even as the prophet from the wilderness dared to stand up and accuse David the king. So there were these men of the wilderness who lived close to God and who seemed to speak with the authority of deity. And this group together were called the prophets. And the Old Testament contains a number of prophetic books attributed to them. And all these books imply that these prophets had in some way attained knowledge of the divine will, of the divine purpose, and were therefore empowered to warn the people of the wrath to come. At the same time, we find running through uh, the Kabbalah, uh, interesting scientific elements. And most of these elements probably must be traced back to the Greek Pythagoreanism. It is sometimes held now that the Essene community at En Gedi by the Dead Sea was originally founded by Pythagoras. In any event, uh, the Greek system certainly influenced both the Essene school and the Therapeutae of Egypt, another mystical Jewish community. The uh, monadology of Pythagoras, his doctrine of number and numeration, uh, certainly has become so associated with the Kabbalah that today many people popularly referring to numerology will call it Kabbalism. Certainly the Kabbalah did deal with a philosophic use of number uh, to represent principles, to represent forces and powers, and to reduce universal processes to numerical equivalents. Also, the old idea of reading uh, the meaning of names seems to have risen from this concept. For today, numerologists will take the letters of a person's name and uh, finding the numerical equivalent of these letters will add them up, place them under the discipline of notoricon and gamatria, as it is called in the Kabbalah, come to a sum number composed of the letters of a name and then attempt to delineate or to variously analyze that person through the number of his name. Also, the ancient Hebrew believed that the days of man's life are numbered. Now, we have always interpreted that to mean that he could only live so long, but that these days might be numbered in some kind of a mathematical or magical manner has not generally occurred to the reader of Scripture. So in the numerical system of Pythagoras and other aspects of Greek philosophy, we find material which later passing through a certain Judaistic interpretation was embodied into the structure of their Kabbalah of Numbers. Uh, Rabbi Akiba in the Sefer Yetzirah, uh, which was the book of the numerations, also gives us valuable information as to the numerical equivalence of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So here we have another phase of the subject. In Kabbalah also, as it passed particularly down into those dark and mysterious years, which we know as the Middle Ages, certain elements of necromancy occurred. 
and uh, to what degree this was essentially different from the demonism of Europe itself, which was passing through a psychological condition, uh, which seemed to make these metaphysical things a little too real. What the relationship was, we do not actually know. But we know that magic mingled with alchemy, that magic is to be found in many of the old hermetic books, and that the various grimoires, or books of conjuration of spirits, all make use of cabalistic elements, thus the signatures of angels and demons, and all of these mysterious rites by which spirits were invoked out of the misty deep of space. All these came finally to be called Kabbalism. Agrippa von Netzheim was one of those uh, scholar mystics, esotericists, who combined magic, hermetic arts, the Kabbalah, into a strange and mysterious compound, uh, which caused him considerable religious difficulty before he got through with it. But at the same time, the policy was present. This is probably one of the reasons why, after we came out of the Dark Ages into a more modern point of view, that the Kabbalah was held in fear or disrepute. It was because it seemingly had been associated with demonology and witchcraft. It was also used and is still used in some parts of Europe and even in parts of Asia where Jewish communities exist uh, for uh, helping so-called possessed persons uh, to get rid of evil spirits and things of that nature. All of these encrustations, however, actually belong to what might be termed the misunderstanding of the subject. Uh, uh, the Jewish congregations in these dark periods were not much better informed than their Christian counterparts, and as a result, superstition was general. And out of this, these superstitious practices uh, have come much of has come much of the bad reputation from which the subject has suffered. Let us assume then, for our purpose at this time that uh, Kabbalism really began, uh, not necessarily among the Jewish people at all, but certainly it arose in a period extending between the 6th century B.C. and the 4th century A.D. This millennia that lies in that span was in that time just about as cataclysmic as our modern world appears to us. New religious interpretations had risen in India and China and Persia. Great philosophers had come to Greece and Egypt. And the centers of culture at that time were moving rapidly in their spiritual understanding uh, from a more or less archaic foundation uh, to the very position which modern religion now occupies. For actually, the religion as we know it in the world today has not greatly changed since this critical period between 600 B.C. and 400 A.D. During that time, almost all of the spiritual beliefs which we hold to be valid today were rising and developing and unfolding and integrating in the ancient world. Therefore, if we go to the great religions of the world, the only important religion that lies outside of this barrier and still survives is Islam. And Islam was certainly a byproduct of this system or situation, though it did not arise for another 150 years. But this whole period was one of man attempting a new attitude toward religion. And this attitude was the gradual shifting from this concept of transcendence to the concept of immanence. The old, old Brahmanic gods had very little interest in the doings of ordinary people. The ancient religious backgrounds of most other countries were formal, were distant. The great pantheons of de deities lived their own lives upon some Olympian slope 
They were the rulers of the world. Their vengeance could be often felt. Uh, their help might be called upon uh, by a community in trouble or a city that was being assailed might raise prayers to its patron deity. But religion as a quiet personal experience in the life of the private citizen had not yet begun to exert its real force. Religion was almost completely a vast ceremonialism. It was man uh, approaching a kind of celestial king who reigned in the same autocratic manner as his duly appointed representatives on earth. This was the time of the divine right of kings, and most of all the divine right of God to be aloof, distant, to send thunderbolts but seldom appear in person. This situation uh, evidently came head-on into changes developing within the psychological integration of the human being himself. Man was growing. Man was unfolding attitudes and convictions. He was outgrowing in a very large way uh, this belief, which even some people hold today, unfortunately, that the great spiritual mysteries of life are simply not for man. Uh, he must leave them alone. He mustn't even dare to explore them. Uh, that was one of the uh, grievances that the medieval church held against the Kabbalists. They were audacious. They dared to examine the, the structure of the universe. They dared to attempt to lift the hem of the robe of the infinite and find out what was behind. This was heresy. This was something that was just not done. And uh, the penalties were similar to those who were inflicted upon scientists or scholars or physicians or mathematicians who dared to speculate about matters held to be purely theological. Uh, the penalties were heavy in those days. But in spite of these penalties, men kept on. For the search for this imminence could not be blocked. Man gradually came to recognize that it was his right to ask questions, that it was his right to gather as they did the elders of the Zohar, and sitting down among themselves with their own associates, uh, really, so to say, take the universe apart. That they had right to question, they had right to analyze, they had right to be unorthodox. And that was getting to be pretty dangerous. But uh, they had also the discretion to clothe their researches in some kind of terminology that might appear to indicate a continual and in fact increasing uh, devotion to religious principles. These uh, various elements had to be uh, brought into a pattern, or else in all probabilities these older teachers could not have survived. So the Kabbalah deals first of all with the idea that there is this universal principle, aim, boundlessness, this boundlessness, however, as absolute deity, is absolutely inscrutable. The root, the mysterious source of all things, uh, the most high of the most high, simply cannot be understood, cannot be known, cannot be grasped by human faculties, for it remains forever in its own aloofness. As Plotinus calls it, it is that which is forever alone. This no one really wished to criticize as a, as a truth or a principle, because man was beginning to realize a little more about the universe in which he lived. Its immensities were unfolding to him through the rational philosophies of Plato and Aristotle. And uh, man began to realize that this universe was suspended from some principle of principles, some universal mystery. 
and that this universal mystery just was not going to be solved very quickly. But this universal mystery abiding forever in space uh, didn't seem to answer all the questions to the, for the person who really was seeking to grow. To grow must result in the state of knowing. As man knows, he grows. The search for knowledge then became identical with the quest for life itself. And the thoughtful person felt that he had a right to understand all that he could understand, to discover all that could be discovered, uh, to bring forth out of nature everything uh, that nature had in it that could be made useful to man or made valuable to man in his own search for life and security. Out of this came one of the essential foundations not only of Kabbalism, but of nearly all mysticism. And that was the, se the sense of two interrelated existences harmonized through the law of analogy. In the Kabbalistic system, therefore, we have the great universal allness of things called the macroprosopus, or the great face. This was the face of space itself. This was the face that man looked upon when he gazed out into the sky. And he had already begun to realize that he could not gaze far enough to look clearly into the features of that face, that it extended out into countless light aeons of distance, and that perhaps if he traveled forever at the speed of light, he might never come near enough to that face to fully comprehend its features. But this whole great sky mystery, bending over him as the god Newt in the Egyptian mythology, uh, this great mystery was the face of the universal. He then devised a parallel concept, the microprosophus, or the little face. This little face was nature. Where well, he came upon the concept of analogy, as given presumably in the Emerald Table of Hermes, namely that superiors and inferiors have a certain resemblance. The creation is the reflection of the Creator. Macroprosopus, looking down into the mystery of creation, beheld its own likeness reflected upon the surface of, of matter. The lesser world was fashioned in the image of the greater world. There were valid analogies between spiritual and material things. And nature, therefore, in some way had to be a key to God. For it became obvious that the inscrutable, the infinite, the one and only cause of all that exists, in some way does cause that which exists to exist. This existence must therefore be in harmony or according to the will of that which causes it. Both the cause and the world it fashioned were so vast, so inscrutable, that it seemed incomprehensible to even the wisest man that anything could really distort this basic relationship. There was nothing that could cause creation as a whole to be untrue to or dissimilar to the Creator. Men might interfere in little things, but they could not interfere in the rising of the sun or the motion of the stars or the formation of elements or the growth of plants or the breeding of animals. These things were universal and they had to some way bear witness to the universal purpose. To behold creation, therefore, was to behold the miniature reflection of the Creator. Those laws which exist in nature must be acceptable to the Creator or they could not exist. Consequently, if we cannot 
know those laws which are spoken by the very mouth of Sophia, the embodiment of wisdom. We at least have the right and power to observe these laws operating around us. And in so doing, we should have the faith and we should have the reason for that faith, by which we can say the laws of nature are also the laws of God. All visible processes are invisible processes made visible, and God is made visible in creation. Not in full and complete majesty, not in the greatest panoply of power, but certainly in a reasonable way, so that man does not just have to follow the revelations of other men. He doesn't have to depend entirely upon the authority of the elders. He does not need to build his entire code upon the so-called wisdom of the past. He has a living wisdom available to him. He has this wisdom which is the wonder and working of the world. So here we have the idea of the great face and its reflection. We have now the possibility of man exploring God through examining the universe. And uh, not only this possibility, but to the Kabbalist and most other mystics, the valid right to do this, even though it might upset some of the best laid schemes of uh, theological institutions. Furthermore, in this analogy between God and nature, there arose another mystery which seemed equally valid and equally important, and that was the mystery of the macrocosm and the microcosm. Now, the macrocosm was the great world with all its machinery, and the microcosm was the little world fashioned in the image of this greater world. And whether it was arrogance or insight, we may never know. But our ancestors came to the conclusion that the most complete working instrument by which the universal will can be made known is man himself. Man is the microcosm. Man is the little creature on biblical authority fashioned in the image of his God. For it is said that God made man in his own image. Male and female created he them. Now, if man was made in the image of God, and certainly the Kabbalah is based upon the Pentateuch, the Talmud and the Mishnah, then it follows that by this same divine authority, by this same divine wisdom revealed by Moses and the prophets, man is in the likeness of his creator. Thus, to see man, in a sense, is to see the creator. Perhaps not just man as a physical organism, but to become aware of the wonder of man, to be able to examine the various garments of man, to examine from the outer part to the inner part of man, is therefore uh, to become aware of the law, of the divine purpose, and of the eternal wisdom. Even Maimonides, who was by no means a Kabbalist, in fact, was one of the greatest of the early Jewish scholars who feared the Kabbalah. Even Maimonides admitted uh, that the nature of man himself was like the nature of the law, of which the outer and visible part, the Torah, corresponds to the body. In the invisible inner part, the Mishnah corresponds to the soul. And the deepest and greatest spiritual mysteries of religion correspond to the spirit in man. Therefore, man, to a measure, is not only an embodiment of nature, but he is the embodiment of the scriptures, of the sacred writings, and all of the mysterious laws by which the universe is maintained. This was not entirely original, however, with the Jewish scholars. It already had been established in India by Hinduism. For the Vedic writings and the Puranas, the great literatures of India, 
both of them build strongly up in their cosmological sections by paralleling creative processes with the creative processes of man. Thus, to their thinking, the universe was generated as man is generated. The universe has its prenatal epoch as man does. The universe lives and grows like a man. It becomes aged, feeble, and ceases like a man. The universe, then, is patterned from a contemplation of the processes taking place in the biology and physiology of human life. This gave the Kabbalah a working foundation, namely that through the exploration of man, the study of all of his parts and members, man might come gradually to understand the universal principle for which he stands. Through the understanding of nature, man can understand the universal plan of which nature is an expression. And also through the contemplation of the sacred writings, the books, the scriptures of the world, which are also microcosms of this knowledge in another way, man can come to understand the Creator as this Creator as manifested in the mystical experiences of human beings. Altogether, then, the Kabbalah now provided a key. And the ancient rabbins of this school declared that the key can be turned seven times in the lock. And in its seven turnings gives man the seven uh, different series of analogies which can be set up by means of which it is possible to explore the Creator through his creation. Now why should man want to know all this about the Creator? What was, the, uh, what was this strange hunger in man who wanted to know God? Uh, the mystic says it is perfectly natural that man should want to know his own source, that being a living thing and continually experiencing life, he should have a reasonable and natural desire to understand this life which he experiences. In searching for his creator, therefore, he is only following the ancient admonition, man know thyself. And it dawned gradually upon his consciousness that he could never know himself without knowing his God. Another reason why this knowledge of the creator, or of the plan of the creator, was so important was because man had already experienced the fallibility of human opinions on these subjects. Very wise persons disagreed constantly. There were many faiths, many gods, many shrines, many creeds and sects, many schools and beliefs. And then, and even more now, man was confused by this complex of inconsistencies. It became gradually obvious to him that his own discrimination, that his own insight was not adequate. If when presented with five great, well-honored beliefs, he did not know with certainty which one to choose, he did not know how to weigh the arguments of one venerated teacher against the arguments of another who had arrived at a different conclusion. He therefore, as an individual, came to realize that there had to be some other way of knowing. There had to be a direct knowing. If there was not, there could be no end of uncertainty. It was also obvious that in this form of direct knowing, there was not a great deal of available information. No one seemed to know how to achieve it. If men had had it, if men had practiced it in the past, they would have come to agreement, but they did not. Consequently, it must be assumed that the average person, though he might be learned and considered wise by his associates, did not necessarily possess this insight, was not necessarily in a position to solve beyond debate or dispute any of the essential problems of life. The more man went on with this and is experiencing of it, the more he also came to another cabalistic conclusion that we face today. Whenever we get a grand panacea for something, when someone makes a pronouncement that is so universal that it seems to be impossible to contradict it, and we try to apply this, 
we suddenly discover that it is not applicable to everybody. We come to the realization that a doctrine which satisfies one will not satisfy another. And if we accomplish a great reform in the world, we find some people are pleased by it and some are not. There is no concept of heaven, for example, that man can devise that will be attractive to everyone who hopes to get there. And that which might be to us a blessed state would be to someone else a cursed condition. There is no uniformity, apparently, of the immediate need of man. His needs are so infinitely diversified. What he seems to need always is a certain comprehension beyond what he has. But when his neighbor tells him the answer to something, it is not this man's answer. It works for the neighbor, but it does not work for him. An answer given by a learned person uh, is satisfactory to ten and unsatisfactory to another ten. Consequently, there is a kind of individualism in human existence. Men are not all cast in exactly the same way. They cannot be held together by one common rule, at least none has yet been found that could hold them. They may even agree, for the most part, on the benevolence of certain concepts or ideas, but then they do not live them. There seems to be something uh, by which the universal solution is not possible, that we cannot be all fed with the same food. We cannot always uh, rejoice in the same experiences, although they may appear to be universally good. The only answer to this type of problem, to the Kabbalist, was that there must be some way in which each individual could tune into his own need, that whatever was next for that person must in some way be available to him. Finally, he is the only one who knows his need. He is the only one who can tell what it is truly satisfied. He is the only one who is able to engineer and implement his own next step forward. Thus, whatever this instruction is, it must be highly individual. It has to be almost as infinitely individual as individuality itself. There's only one possible answer to this mystery namely that what man needs must be immediately available in himself, that his search for solution must always be in terms of himself, in terms of reaching into some root within his own nature by which he will learn that which is next in the divine plan for the unfoldment of himself as he is, not as he would like to be, not as he wishes he was, not as he sometimes may think himself to be, but what he actually is, an estimate which he may not be able to arrive at even by his own best judgment. All this, then, uh, does finally bear heavily upon that point in which the Kabbalah most closely came into conformity with the Gnosis, or the doctrine of the Gnostics. And that is this problem of emanation. Emanation is the only way in which uh, the Gnostics, the Manicheans, and several other early sects, including the Persians, the only way in which they could reconcile two opposites. It would see th seem that these opposites must emanate or cause to radiate from themselves conditions of themselves and that these conditions could meet even if the essential natures themselves were too far separated. For example, from the sun comes constantly a radiance of light. And uh, while the sun itself would probably be infinitely too splendid for man to approach and survive, yet this light from the sun is its emanation. Wherever this emanation goes, certain qualities of the sun go with it. And this emanation may extend countless light years into space, touching one planet in its orbit, as in the case of the Earth, and touching another, as in the case of Saturn. 
Now the light of the sun on Saturn will be less than it is on Earth because it is further from the sun. But that light in its own way must sustain the life upon Saturn or make it possible for this planet to be likewise fruitful. Consequently, by emanation, that which is further removed it has a different destiny by this circumstance alone. Uh, that which receives this solar intensity less brilliantly must adjust to a different kind of life. This life may be just as good for all that we know, but it has to be different because the proximity of the body itself to the source of light determines some of its qualities, determines to a certain degree its nature and substance. In the same way, the proximity, proximity of man to the source of his light, which is truth, has a great deal to do with his character. Uh, we uh, find in the Kabbalah then the same concept that is everywhere present from the study of emanation, namely that you have no principle in nature of either good or evil. You have only a principle of light and the absence of light or the diminution of light. So we have the old philosophic definition that evil is not a thing in itself but the least degree of good. It is a degree of good less than that uh, which is present in some other creature. Therefore we say that this lesser creature is bad in reference to this other creature which is better. In nature, therefore, there is reality and its gradual diminution through emanation until somewhere reality seemingly dies in illusion. But this illusion is not a principle. It is merely that which lies too far from the center of the light of truth. Ignorance is not a principle, but it is that condition in which the mind is far removed from the source of wisdom. But the mind may approach wisdom and coming nearer receive more of it even if a planet moving toward the sun will become warmer or more brilliant as the result. So in emanations we have a universe in which two extremes are brought together by a series of conditions. And in this the Kabbalah goes into astronomy. And in the ancient system of astronomy you had a, a, a group of three essential factors. You had the highest factor, which was the zodiac. Then you had the orbits of the seven planets, and then you had the Earth with its four elements. Uh, the Kabbalah would liken deity to the zodiac as creator. It would liken the Earth to the planet Earth, which in the old system was placed in the middle of the circles. This would be nature. Between these two were the orbits of the seven spirits, or the Elohim, that move upon the face of the deep. And forth from each end, in the middle of the seven planets, was the sun in their system, uh, with the three planets, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars, above it, and the three lesser lights of the old system, Venus, Mercury, and the moon below, and the form of a ladder extending uh, from the earth to the sky, the ladder of seven rungs, the ladder upon which Jacob saw angels ascending and descending. This placed the sun itself in the midst of the whole system. This was the uh, Pythagorean theory of music, for it was by placing the fret on the string in the relation of the sun in the midst of the string, in the middle part, that produced the interval of the octave. To the seven planetary orbits, then to the band of the zodiac, and then to the little door in the sky described by St. John in the Apocalypse, beyond which was the Shamayim, or the vast, mysterious crystal sea of the divine nature. This was the way they set up the universe, according to their knowledge, and it has become our Ptolemaic system which was to remain comparatively unchallenged except by a few scholars until the rise of the Copernican theory. 
Both the earth began to produce creatures according to its kind. And these creatures then began to represent an ascending order of life. Uh, the life which was locked in the earth in the process of descending through emanation began to rise again through emanation. And the Kabbalists believe that this ascending from the earth resulted in the kingdoms reaching upward from the earth toward uh, their source. So that you might say there descended a great light or vitality from circumference of a great sphere to its center. In the center it formed uh, the great eye, the eye of Ketha, uh, the eye which is the eye of Israel, or the eye of the God of Israel, which neither slumbers nor sleeps, uh, the, uh, the great open eye that has no lid. This was locked in the midst of the lowest level of the emanation, which is the earth itself, as a seed. And the seed then turns and begins to grow. And the seed then begins to emanate back through the great septenary system to the source from which it came. Spencer calls the descent of this light into the earth, or this life into the earth, involution. And the ascent of it out of the earth and back again into its full space consciousness, evolution. And the seed coming forth from the ground uh, is the mysterious verbum or the word made flesh, uh, which we read about. For this is the parable, says Jesus. The, uh, the seed is the word of God. The word of God was the creating power. Now as this begins to grow and unfold, from the earth come the elements, come water, fire, and air. And from the kingdoms of nature, from the earth, which is the mineral, comes the plant, the animal, and the human. And if we assign these to these steps going upward, we find then that the earth represents the earth. The water becomes symbolic of the moon. Uh, the fire becomes, uh, the element of fire becomes symbolical of Mercury. Of uh, air becomes symbolical of Venus. And so up this entire ladder, but those are the only four elements that we have so Paracelsus gives us the fifth or magical element, the, el the uh, element of the elixir of life, Azoth, which corresponds to the fourth orbit of the sun. In the case of the various creatures coming out, earth represents the mineral, uh, water or the moon represents the vegetable, uh, the mercury represents uh, the uh, animal kingdom, Venus represents the human kingdom, and then we have this other thing. This man who is not of the earth, but of enlightenment. A man himself divides into two definite orders of life, the earth man and the sky man. A man as an, a creature growing up in the prehistoric world, the man of the Neanderthal man, or the piltdown man, or any one of these types, it finally gives place to the man of wisdom and the man of light. And the true humanity of man is born when man is ensouled and becomes a living thing. And this carries him to the ring of the sun. And the enlightened man therefore stands in the middle distance between heaven and earth. And this same relationship is used in another analogy where heaven becomes spirit, earth becomes matter, and man becomes soul. And in this system, the orbit of the sun is the orbit of the world soul. So we have a deity descending from spirit through soul into body. We have man ascending from body through soul to spirit. And as these two great processes slowly merge and mingle, we have the great Gnostic system of emanations, in which divine life flowing downward meets the growth of itself out of the earth through creation, so that creation grows up toward the Creator, even while the Creator is flowing downward into the creation. 
These are finely mingled in the Chinese yang yin symbol, or the flowing half circles, to result ultimately in the re-identification and absolute unity and unification of creature and creator, so that finally both become again the indescribable unit, uh, the, the, the one that can never uh, be broken or lost. And of course, yoga in India is simply a name for this motion upward to union with cause. So the emanation theory is man emanating more and more spiritual overtones until he is brought again into harmony with the divine life which is his true substance and nature. This is the way both the Gnostics and the Kabbalists attempted to uh, explain the bridge or the bridging across of the two extremes of spirit and matter. We have to use the same thing uh, even when we think of man as spirit and matter. When we think of man as a spiritual entity, we must regard him as a space being. We have no way of knowing what he is, what he looks like, what he is going to do, he is locked in the inscrutability of his own absolute abstraction. But man, by the process of involution or descent, gradually clothes this inscrutability with an increasingly tangible vestment, until finally at birth he stands embodied, which means that his life principle has gradually built around him various psychic fields has communicated these psychic and rational fields with his outer body by nerves, by arteries, by veins, by endocrine uh, units, and all this type of connective tissue, so that finally that which is within man as more than body is finally able to express itself outwardly in the material world. This is where the Kabbalah uses the analogy of the microcosm to express the creative processes of God. Now man having been born is then, we might say, like the seed of God buried in the earth. The seed of his consciousness is buried within him. Gradually he must gain control of this body. Gradually through growth he must find the unfoldment of the life within himself. Through education, through culture, through civilization, he, we finally discover that he comes into some type, not adequate, but some type of maturity. And in this maturity, he reaches the point of self-direction. He, he re reaches the point of self-determinism. We say that he is adult. We say that he is now ready to take on the living of his own life. He has become an individual, and individuality is one of the keys of the sun symbolism. For in ancient astrology, the sun was the symbol of individuality. So it means that man has reached upward on this ladder now until he has united himself at, with the sun, which is in the dead center uh, of the ladder. Three and a half runs from the bottom, three and a half runs from the top. Thus, in the, in the attaining of this, man reaches, theoretically, into the state of soul existence. Man has become, by evolution, a living soul. By this is further implied that in the process of evolution man has released soul power, that he is gradually growing into a psychic entity rather than into a physical entity. It is interesting, therefore, perhaps, that within the last fifty years man has begun to labor with the problem of soul identity. He is more and more interested in what his soul is. He is no longer willing to think of this soul merely as a theological abstraction. He is beginning to say, what do we mean by soul? And out of this subject he has evolved the subject of psychology. And psychology, while it is now largely concerned with mental phenomena, was originally, in its classical meaning, the science of the soul. And even today, considering mental phenomena, it could well be stretched to mean that it is the science of the person living in the body. It is the science of this being that is suspended halfway between heaven and earth, bound to the earth by the body, 
bound to heaven by instincts, impulses, ideals, convictions, aspirations within itself. So uh, it has always been assumed that the human race, in its highest aspect, was the embodiment of soul. That therefore soul became, so to say, a heavenly kingdom beneath heaven. And in the uh, learned discourses and uh, dissertations of the elders in the Sefer HaZoha, the human soul is represented as one of the temples of Jerusalem. Here, for example, we have the concept of three temples. The Muslim and the Hindu have the same idea, namely that on the earth, on the rock of Moriah, on the threshing floor of the Jebusites stands Solomon's temple, or stood Solomon's temple in the ancient days. This was the earthly temple. In the heavenly world itself uh, was another temple, which was the living habitation of deity, and it was suspended above the earth over the site of Solomon's temple, such as discussed in the Zohar. But this is the temple in heaven, uh, of which the earthly temple is a worldly shadow. Then there is a third temple, which is the temple of man's own soul. And this is suspended between the three, between the other two, making the triad. Thus, beneath the temple of spirit, suspended in the midst of the system, is the temple of the soul found in Christianity in the account of the transfiguration of Jesus. And beneath that, on the Brat Moriah, is the physical symbol of the congregation of Israel. So these three temples represent the three great places or stations of worship. They represent the temple of nature. They represent the temple of man, and they represent the vast temple of heaven itself. And also we have the concept that the whole creation itself is a sanctuary. That this sanctuary is again reproduced in man, where the heart is the matchless altar of his soul. And in nature also, in external or exoteric worship, the temple becomes the symbol of the congregation of the faithful. It is the ecclesia of the early church. It is the temple that is not made of stone, but made up of the body of the congregation, which uniting produces a certain spiritual mystery, which is again discussed in the Zohar. But for our purpose of emanations, then, we have the concept of two irreconcilable opposites, so to say, uh, not reconciled by coming together, but each one by giving something. It is a reconciliation of two friends in which this means that we must bear and forbear, that uh, if our friend takes a step toward us, we must take a step toward him. And therefore, by our tolerance, by our temperance, by our understanding, we come finally to meet in middle ground. And in the Zohar it is also called this, the uh, emanationism by means of which the family is made possible. Because if two human beings decide to live together, and neither will give anything of themselves, but will remain completely isolated in their own authoritarianism, there can be no home, and there can be no real family. A home and family must be the result of a certain series of emanations, in which each person moves a little from his own position to a common ground. And in the Chinese philosophy, of course, we know that the Chinese held that when heaven and earth met on common ground, the result was man, the child of heaven and earth. So that man is, in a mysterious way, a symbol of the reconcilia reconciliation of opposites. He is also the symbol of the ground in which the divine and natural emanations mingle, thus making man a unique creature in a way or any other creature that attains this level becomes in itself unique because it is in equilibrium. It is the only kingdom which is mid-distance between superior and inferior, and is the one in which it is perfectly possible for the psychic life to tip either way according to the inclinations of the temperament itself. 
The Egyptians held this also. They declaring the soul of man to be balanced at the middle point of a pair of scales. If this individual inclines downward by his conduct, the conduct drifting into material or negative conditions, then the soul falls. If, however, the individual, by the extension of his consciousness, raises himself to a higher level, then the soul is lifted up toward God. A man is the creature who, by the quality of his own conduct, can raise or cast down his own psychic life. He does this by uniting the psychic life with the body which is to cast it down, or to unite his psychic life with his own spiritual core of conviction which is to raise it up. This problem then of being raised up or cast down becomes a constant alternation in the life of man. Uh, at any moment, some part of man's nature may ascend or descend. In moments of selfishness, something descends. In moments of altruism, something ascends. In moments of uh, hate, again, something descends. In a moment of love, something ascends toward truth or principle. All values, therefore, which are good result in the rising of the soul towards its own next spiritual state, greater proximity to the substance of truth. Whereas all infirmities of the soul or delinquencies of character cause it to incline backward towards its uh, physical or natural origin and is therefore a regression in terms of man's uh, achieved condition in the world today. So here we have a little concept of, of how the Kabbalah handles these particular problems. Now the next uh, nature, next situation that arises in the development of our Kabbalistic thinking has to do with the problems which particularly uh, affect the individual in his daily life, and that is the, this problem of knowing good and evil. Uh, we know, we have said, that uh, if man does good, certain good comes. If man does ill, something ill happens. But we have learned this mostly by trial and error. And as each individual is an individual, and we are not even sure that man is capable of learning by the experience of others, it would seem as though humanity from the beginning to the end must continue to make its own mistakes that each person must, through trial and error, discover those ways that are right. This becomes a, a very long, difficult, dragged out situation. It would make it seem as though each individual must go through the whole gamut of mistakes before he is capable of a virtue. Uh, to a measure, perhaps, this is justified, but the Kabbalah takes a little different viewpoint on it and perhaps is able to give a certain consolation. There are two kinds of mistakes that the soul can make. One of these mistakes is that which results uh, from inability or unwillingness uh, to obey or follow uh, the approved laws of its kind. Uh, soul collectively creates culture. Therefore, the fact that man is a human being, that man has certain potentials within himself, that he belongs to a level, he is not the same as an ape, he is not the same as a handful of earth, he is not the same as a tree. Man has a certain level of his own nature. And because he has this level, and because he has attained to it, he has a certain commonness of experience and life. Out of this commonness, there has arisen from his own internal psychical life a kind of credo, a sort of composite way of life. It is this soul in man which went forth to build cities. It is this soul which in the form of Nimrod, the mighty hunter, was resolved to slay God with an arrow. It is this soul which in all of its different departments and its different uh, levels of internal expression has slowly been unfolding through the ages 
to give us what we call the great era of scientific discoveries that we now have, or the earlier era of navigations that once dominated the world. It is this common level that has given us our art, our music, our literature, our poetry, everything that we know as our cultural heritage. This cultural heritage would be of absolutely no value to any creature except ourselves. Uh, we can live in this cultural environment and we can plant a seed of a flower bed in our yard. This seed will grow and fold itself and fulfill its own destiny, totally indifferent as to whether the Republicans or Democrats are running the country. It is, without, it is outside of that plant's need, outside of its experience, outside of anything that it can use. Therefore, it simply does not respond to it. Also, the plant, having not as yet attained to certain levels, has needs that we have forgotten and therefore which we cannot entirely understand or comprehend. But man, because he has created a cultural system such as he has, has created all types of psychic and philosophical institutions, educational systems and so forth, to meet the general level of his needs. Now man, according to the uh, Zohar, breaks within his own level into many sub-levels. And uh, there are 49 levels of human function recognized in the ancient writings. And these are brought together by the mystery of the 50th level, which is the God-man. So that the individual, therefore, has 49 different levels of essential humanness on which he can function. These levels are sending to the, from the most primordial human individuality to the highest conceivable human individuality. Yet regardless of these 49 levels of difference, all these creatures are human. They therefore have this essential spark of their humanity uh, which they share together. And out of this psychic level as a total has come a highly diversified culture, a highly diversified language pattern, much difference in, in religions, in concepts, in interests, in trades, and crafts, but they all belong within the structure of humanity itself. Therefore, this whole world of which our humanity is uh, concerned, with which we are built out of our own ingenuity on the face of nature, uh, this human world in nature is the projection of the psychic life of man. It is therefore, so to say, his own soul made stick and stone and mortar. This uh, concept to the Zohar meant that in the common experience of man as collective soul beings, there have arisen revelations such as the very revelation of the Safa HaZohar itself. The, the wise and the good have given us certain instructions, certain keys. We have a general, basic knowledge of the machinery of the human soul. We have a certain general, basic knowledge of the direction in which man should go. Today we are very much concerned about the way in which man is going. But there are very few people who would be able to prove conclusively to themselves or anyone else that man does not know better than he is doing. And though by knowing I now mean that he does not, he, we cannot deny that he possesses an intellectual concept of a way of life better than he is living. To meet, to meet this problem then, uh, the Zohar points out that the broad program of what is necessary for man is for the most part understood by man because such understanding is the sole heritage of the human being. Every human being, even the most primitive, inherits a certain instinct by which it can take a step forward. The Digger Indian and the Hottentot and the Zulu can take a step forward and they are taking steps forward. No matter how primitive we consider man to be, he can move because he has the power to go forward within himself. He has the power to comprehend that which is next, 
beyond his present comprehension. And he has the insight to know what is next. He doesn't know ultimates, but he knows what is next. And the problem is to give him the moral stamina to do that which he knows. And this has been always the big problem. So the Zohar takes the attitude that it isn't necessary to prove to man that he should do more than he is doing. It isn't necessary to prove to him that he can be more than he is, because this innately he knows. It is part of his soul heritage. He knows that he lives. He knows that he is able to build a better house than his ancestor was. He knows that it is perfectly possible for him to unfold arts and abilities, that he has talents which he can release. His talents may be different from those of others and not as great as those of some, but he still can do more. Thus there's no real reason, no particular virtue, in trying to tell him this. The prophets of old have so told him. The great teachers of his race have so instructed him. And he has received from them all, as from the tablets of the law upon the mount, he has received codes of conduct which have survived for thousands of years because experience has proved that they are workable. Man, the moment he finds a code that is no use, forgets it. But these codes which he cannot forget are rooted in the acceptance of them by his psychic life, even if not by his objective individual conscious personality. When uh, we say a man, thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not kill, inwardly man knows this is right. He may not have the courage to follow it, but he knows it. And he also has a sense that these laws originate not just within his own kind, but some way belong to this mystery of the macroposopus. They belong to the intricate operations of universal law operating around him. The proof of them is visible in the heavens and in the earth. So man has this type of instruction. The Zohar sensing this, recognizing it, also finally comes to the great conclusion which nearly all religions have come to, namely that creation takes place within the consciousness of God and not apart from it. The idea that God had a consciousness of its own or his own in which it was completely enveloped and that the universe was a sort of a divine afterthought does not uh, apply uh, well to the philosophic inclinations of men. The belief is that uh, the Zohar and the Kabbalah unfold the usual and traditional argument in defense of this Namely, that if we affirm that God is all there is, that God is one, that this great being, Aim, the boundless, extends to the infinity of things, that there is nothing beyond it, there is nothing apart from it, and in the beginning it was one substance indivisible, that it was one divine unknowable consciousness extending forever. If this is true, and there was one and one only, the Pythagorean monad, the one which cannot be a two, then it is obvious that creator, creating, can create only with the substances of itself, from the substances of itself, and ultimately within the grand substance of itself. Creation cannot be dangling outside of the divine nature because this nature goes everywhere. You can find no circumference for it. Creation must therefore take place within it. When we see the two arising from the one, therefore, in the Pythagorean theory, we cannot say that there are now two ones. We must say that existence is now one in terms of halves. That the uh, universal creating power divides within itself, but itself is never divided. Therefore, multiplicity arises within unity, but un multiplicity does not overwhelm and destroy unity. The one always remains, just as the infinite multiplication of cells in the human body must always take place within the original germinating cell. 
and from the walls of the original cell must be and will be ultimately formed the skin which covers the entire body. The cells multiply within the cell, but the original cell is not divided. The creation exists as an infinite diversity within unity, but unity is never divided. Therefore, the sum of parts must always be the one. There can never be more and there can never be less. And in all figuring, if every atom of the universe it is counted as a separate fractional unit. The sum of everything must never exceed one, because one is all there is. So we can have this infinite division, but we cannot divide unity. Nor can we take an infinite and declare either its center or its circumference in fact. We cannot declare that there is any essential difference in the infinite life within which the diversity of existence occurs. So whatever occurs, occurs within life itself. It is a manifestation. From life it comes, from the infinite life it comes. By life it is supported, and to life again it returns. Therefore the Zohar very early stated the fact that there is no death. The death is merely an infinite changing of the arrangement of fragments. The patterns are forever changing, disappearing and appearing again. But disappearance is not into death but into life. And appearance is not from death but from life. The only reason anything can be born is because everything is alive. The only reason that immortality is possible is because nothing can die in a universe in which there is only one life. Buddhism takes one viewpoint on it and affirms that the ultimate is to be reunited with the totality. Western philosophy has assumed an infinite continuance of individuality within this life. But still, the great life itself is like an ocean and all creation creatures inhabiting this sea. And they cannot come out of the sea. They can never have any other habitat. So they are living forever in an eternal life principle. To, that, to this point, then, it becomes obvious, or became obvious to the Kabbalists, that there can be no essential interval at any point between God and creation. The essential interval, which we uh, describe as the basis of emanations, is not based upon the fact that deity is further away or nearer, but rather that deity evolving individuality to create man or to create the psychic life creates a series of hypothetical intervals which have to be crossed by these emanations. This total life is ever present, but in some way the little individual lives existing within it have an individuality. And this wall of individuality around them is the wall that separates them consciously from the total life. Thus individuality creates separateness, and it is only through the gradual overwhelming or overcoming of separateness that unity can be re-established as experienced fact. Up to that time, man lives in the ocean and dies of thirst. The individual lives in a universe of life and believes that he dies. He lives in a universe of God's love, and yet he is miserable most of the time. Not because of the absence of the divine, but because of the absence of this emanational bridge from his own ego, by means of which he can experience this. So the Kabbalist comes to his concept of eminence. He comes to the realization that individual consciousness is, is like a ship floating on this sea that it is, a, it is a structure of traversing or existing within this infinite life principle, and that this life principle is ever available, and that the single atom only exists because it is dancing in life. But to, uh, to capture the conscious presence of this life as a spiritual fact requires 
Not that man shall journey to some remote area or wait until he can climb this ladder and disappear through the door of heaven, but to realize that all of these processes are symbolical, that man, the little microcosm, has his elements, his planets, and his zodiac, beyond which is the life which he is seeking to become united with. So we find the doctrine of eminence, and we find the rise of mysticism, by which the individual realizes that by the gradual expansion of consciousness, he is able to build the bridge above the orbit of the sun and to uh, the uh, wall of heaven. That above intellect is consciousness itself. And that therefore, through the power of releasing his own consciousness, man bridges the final interval between himself and the superior power. In other words, he emanates from his soul nature more and more arcs of emanation upward until finally, through the gradual extension of soul power, he comes into the ultimate identity with spiritual reality. He does this by the perfecting, unfolding, and developing of his own soul nature. And the uh, Kabbalah follows the same principles of other religions through meditation, through prayer, through contemplation, uh, through gradual improvement in the higher forms of abstract creative arts and knowledges, man gradually comes nearer and nearer to enlightenment. The purpose of all knowledge in the Zohar is not that man shall know, but that man shall perform an alchemy of bringing his consciousness back to eternity. The only reason why we master any art or science is not that we shall make a living with it here, that is incidental, but that this mastery gives us another uh, emanational art from ourselves toward truth, that we are groping toward truth through knowledge. But we are also groping toward truth through understanding, uh, which the prophets make much of, and of which David sings in the Psalms. That uh, we can have all things, but most of all, that the Lord give us understanding. Understanding is an ability to accept. To understand is to grasp the full meaning. To grasp the full meaning is to experience this meaning within ourselves. And in the Zohar and in the Old Testament also, nearly everywhere where the word understanding is used, what we term the mystical experience is implied. It is the individual suddenly becoming vitally and livingly aware of the nature of that which is superior to himself. In this mystical system, then, we have all these contemplative disciplines. And I have found in the Zohar and other parallel writings much that will cause me to suspect that these people were fully aware of yoga and that a great deal of their so-called veil teaching had to do with this process, this very definite process of creating uh, the body of illumination. Uh, in the Muslim philosophy, for example, the prayer rug is the magic carpet. It is the symbol of the power of consciousness uh, to carry the individual through the various strata of the universe. The prayer rug, was, as might be suspected, is where the man kneels during prayer. And prayer is his unworldliness. It is while in this inward communion that he is lifted up upon the symbol of the magic carpet, his prayer rug, and carried to various parts of the universe the universe of conscious internal experience, not physically carried from one town to another. In the Kabbalah, we have the equivalent of this prayer rug in the Merkaba, or the chariot of righteousness, described by Ezekiel. The, the chariot of righteousness is, in my feeling, the structure of what the Hindus call the yoga. In other words, it is a series of disciplines which becomes the vehicle by means of which man is lifted up into a transcendent experience of consciousness. The ancient prophet was picked up in the Merkava and carried to heaven without death. And this was the symbol also of Al-Barak, the mysterious creature that carried 
Muhammad on his night vision uh, to Mecca. This, uh, this symbolism has to do with the creation of this transcendent inner life, which is the Merkava or chariot of righteousness. Man perfecting the soul, bringing it finally to its full maturity, finds that the soul becomes this mysterious instrument, this vehicle by which the being is then projected further upward into the realms of light and consciousness. Uh, the, the whole experience of the individual, the secret doctrine, the discipline, the secret mysterious transcendental art by which man unfolds or perfects his inner life is therefore this chariot that must carry him without death into the presence of the Most High. The same concept is carried in the three mysterious visions of Moses on Mount Sinai in which in the end Moses is picked up and carried into a cloud. And as he passes through the cloud, he comes into the presence of Maker Prosopis, the Great Face. This is nothing but a mystical experience. It is the individual which if lifted up, uh, or his consciousness lifted up within him, uh, draws all other things to itself and constitutes a mysterious resurrection. Uh, the restoration of the spiritual life of man who is climbing in this way the higher rungs of the ladder that takes him back to the source of which he from the so to the source from which he came. This uh, macabre of righteousness is the deepest mystery of the Kabbalah. It has to do with this process of man's absolute regeneration. And this regeneration process, as the elders of themselves have pointed out, is no mystery at all. The, the macabre is the mystery of mysteries that is no mystery. The macabre is provided by nature itself. It is perfectly natural, it is perfectly reasonable, it is ever available. Yet it remains to the average person, even the average mystic, a total and inscrutable mystery. The reason for that is that the macabre is an alchemical thing that is produced by the simple process of conduct and action itself. The individual applying the principles of his integrity to the conduct of his life transforms himself into that chariot without any actual, factual realization of what he's doing. It is simply that the Merkaba has to be built out of the deed and not out of the word. The macabre is built by the practical, inevitable, factual effort of the individual to grow. It is not what he hopes he will accomplish, what he was going to do sometime. It is not these principles which he loves sincerely and disobeys continually. This is, this is not the answer. The macabre is built when the individual, by dedication, begins the actual practicing of the virtues which he affirms to be true. As he achieves these virtues, as he makes self-discipline the law of his life, as he gradually and victoriously triumphs over the limitations of his own attitudes, as he corrects his faults and advances his virtues, he transforms his own psychic life into this chariot of righteousness. So well, that's what it is. It is a chariot built of his own righteousness. And by this building, he is lifted up or carried without death into the mystery of the Makroposophus, or the presence of the great face. It means that not necessarily that his physical body continue forever, but that without the obscuration of death, without fear of death, because of gradually increased inner realization, and because the mystical experience of eternal life becomes the great reality in him, the individual without fear, without doubt, or without the experience of transition, lives part of an eternal life in an eternal universe. The realization of this is the end of death. The end of death is not that we no longer die. The end of death is that we no longer accept the idea of death itself. From the moment that is gone, through experience, not through affirmation, 
But through conscious experience of the meaning of life, the individual has achieved within himself his own immortality. Now these are the substances of the doctrine, and I have drawn them very largely from the notes and the opinions uh, of uh, Baron von Rosenroth. So this will give you a little summary of the doctrine which he attempted to promulgate in the 17th century, and perhaps you will now appreciate some of the difficulties that he ran against. Well, thank you very much. We hope to see you again next week. Von Rosenroth was aware of this. He sensed it long ago. He knew that this very mysterious subject was deep, was important, but like most of the scholars of his time, he was unable to cope with it in a complete manner. Individuals who knew much less than he did have therefore risen as his critics, complaining about minor errors of translation and uh, worrying about the possible alternative meanings of carefully worded phrases. But in spite of this picking process, which has so long attempted to discredit honest scholarship, his volumes remain as the great monument, for they signify the first real effort to use Kabbalism to bridge the interval between Jewish and non-Jewish thinking. Up to the time of von Rosenroth, practically all of the Kabbalistic literature was in Jewish only. And uh, the non-Jewish European society had no particular interest in this literature. In fact, they were really afraid of it. It became involved in a great many rather unsavory legends and was finally regarded by orthodox non-Jewish people as perhaps some form of Satanism, uh, endangering the morality of the virtuous. But now that these older clouds have passed from the horizon, we are interested in trying to understand one of the most confusing, perplexing, and austere of all concepts of life. I suppose the only uh, parallel work in obscurity is the Chinese volume, the Yi Ging, or Classic of Changes. And in many respects, the two works are similar. Both deal with extremely obscure metaphysical concepts. Both have a tremendous traditional antiquity, and both have survived to this time much to the wonder and even consternation of scholars. Within the last 15 or 20 years, however, the Yi Ging has become of interest far outside the boundaries of China. And the interest of the Jungian psychologists in the Chinese classic of changes may possibly indicate that in the future men of similar minds will uh, begin to explore uh, the recondite side of the Kabbalah. We really know very little about the antiquity of this work. Um, we know that it was first circulated in Europe about the year 1305. At that time, the principal exponent was Rabbi Moses of Leon, and for a long time it was assumed that he had fabricated the great Kabbalistic book, the Sefa HaZohar, or the Book of the Splendors. It was just taken for granted that he had fabricated and manufactured the entire work. More recently, however, it became obvious that if he did, he was perhaps the most extraordinary mind in history. It became easier to us infinitely available. 
The deity was not far away always, not looking down from an omnipotence upon a tired world, but that in some way deity was here. Deity was therefore imminent. It was available at any moment to be reached, to be understood in some measure, uh, to bestow its consolation uh, upon the suffering heart and the broken pride and the tortured soul. This Mahayana Buddhism uh, accomplished in connection with classical Buddhism, which was the rather austere doctrine that Gautama gave the world. This doctrine of Gautama was also too transcendent for the average Hindu to live by. He needed this softening, gentle touch. He needed this doctrine of the Bodhisattvas, the wonderful beings who with their great ears listened forever to the sorrows of men, who were always available through prayer, and uh, who interceded with the universe as consolers of human sorrow. The church fell somewhat into this same problem, and from it instinctively, patterning upon older peoples, Christianity developed its doctrine of saints and the doctrine of intercession, by which the individual in his spiritual need was able to bridge the interval between humanity and divine help. So we have in Kabbalism this arising among a people previously almost completely deficient in this particular attitude, almost uh, entirely uh, lost in a strange spiritual austerity, something perhaps suggestive of Brahmanism something suggestive of the wonderful, deep, but incomprehensible wisdom of the universal power itself. Men could not live entirely supported only by the belief that God was wise. They had to also experience the fact that God was good, that God was love, that God was ever-present help in time of trouble. It therefore would seem reasonable that during the difficult periods in Jewish history, a number of sects should arise, like the Gebers of Hebron, the Nazarites, and the Essenes, who were to emphasize uh, this phase of the Divine Presence, that not only to the great scholar, the learned master of the Sanhedrin, would this spiritual presence of God be known, but also to just ordinary people who could reach deity in some inward experience of their own. While uh, the old Jewish system did not emphasize such intercession, it was to a measure present, at least archetypally, in their beliefs. For the system of Jewish prophets is almost unique in the religious literature of the world. These men of the wilderness and in the desert, these comparatively uncouth persons who dared to rise up in the presence of kings and threaten the wrath of God upon the unbeliever or the disobedient, assume that this man, who though brilliant was not exceptional, had secured his information elsewhere. It just became too large a subject uh, to be encompassed within the life and ability of one person. Rabbi Moses was a very busy man. His life was fairly well known. There was not much possibility that a work of the magnitude of the Zohar could have been produced by him without others knowing about the processes. He would certainly have had to call upon rare reference material and things of that nature. And this was not apparently the direction of his life at all. So perhaps it would be wiser to assume 
that his own idea, his own statement at the time, was reasonably valid. Namely, that the work had come into his possession in manuscript form as part of the unwritten or unpublished, we'll say, legacy of Israel. In other words, that it was a work long secretly known, passed in rare copy from one great scholar to another, and that it finally came to his conviction that it should be brought together and made available to the world. To explain the origin of the work, Rabbi Moses uh, ben Leon therefore took the attitude or held forth the belief that is more or less contained within the text itself, that the original author was a Rabbi Simeon ben Yokoi, a man who uh, wrote the work or compiled it under inspiration about the year 161 A.D. during the reign of the Roman uh, Caesar Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Uh, this Rabbi Simeon was a mystic. Uh, to escape Roman persecution, he went into the wilderness and lived in a cave. And here for many years, he was supposed to have received mystical experiences, forms of illumination. The prophets of old came to him. He received instruction from the angelic hosts that are referred to in the uh, Pentateuch. As a result of this great length of time in isolation in this cave, he gradually wrote down or transcribed this mystic doctrine. However, of course, the Rabbi Simeon did not himself claim that he invented the idea. He did not invent the Kabbalah. Nor is it actually de demonstrable that he was the first to write on the subject in ancient times. Actually, I think we will have to assume that the Kabbalah more or less accumulated. And all of this accumulation did not take place within the body of ancient Jewry itself. The moment we begin to investigate the subject, uh, we come upon a number of rather interesting possibilities. The date 161 A.D. may be comparatively correct for an important revelation by compilation of certain doctrines that were available in the Near East at that time. The actual structure of the Kabbalah shows that it is profoundly indebted to Gnosticism the sect that was flourishing at that time in North Africa and in parts of Syria, a sect which has come again into prominence in recent years from the discovery of the great Gnostic library at Chenobaskian in central Egypt. Uh, the Gnostics taught a doctrine of emanations as a means of reconciling the Creator as an abstract principle, God, and the creation as a concrete structure. Uh, the problem of bridging between deity in its universal and mystical sense and the formal universe. This problem was one of the great problems of Gnosticism, and uh, it is also one of the essential elements in the great Kabbalistic system. Also at this time, we must remember that Mahayana Buddhism was rising in India, perhaps had already risen. And this conveys another important element, which perhaps had been generally neglected in the Near East, and therefore was felt to be necessary in the unfoldment of Jewish religion. Uh, the Kabbalah, for example, deals with a basic problem of the difference between transcendence and imminence. Transcendence in this sense means the transcendence of God. 
Jewish religion had, orthodoxly speaking, created a God above and superior to the world. This deity uh, rested eternally above the world and the planets and beyond the grasp and contact of living things. Seated on its eternal throne, it was an absolute despot over creation. This distant, all-powerful God, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, uh, was scarcely the concept of deity most useful to the Jewish people during the Roman captivity. Uh, the Jewish empire kingdom was gone. These people had received a tremendous spiritual disaster into themselves. This, the, this disaster undermined faith. It undermined the old way of life. It seemed to cry out that God had forgotten Israel. It seemed as though there was too much of punishment and not enough of forgiveness in the divine nature. This God of powers and glories, this El Shaddad the Strong, was not the type of deity that could comfort a sick, forlorn, and miserable scattered people. Something nearer, something more immediate to their lives was very necessary to them. There is really no doubt in the world that this was also one of the mainsprings of Christianity, which arose in the same general area, and also came to a people weary and disillusioned and tired. Uh, this sense of Christian immediacy certainly profoundly affected the religions of the West, especially through the Christology of St. Paul. So it is quite possible that Mahayana Buddhism, which had this uh, tremendous emphasis upon the immediacy of spiritual authority, that it was not something infinitely remote, but something Well, this evening we have a little light literature here. <laughs> but I gave you a break. I only brought the first volume. Uh, this work, which was published the first volume in 1677 and the second volume a few years later may be described as the fountainhead of our literature of Kabbalism. The author was a very profound scholar, Christian Knorr, Baron von Rosenroth. He was a university professor and not Jewish, but Christian. Yet with this background, he became profoundly interested in what has been called the secret doctrine in Israel. He was certainly a man born before his time, for during the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, the very subject of the Kabbalah was not only not frequently mentioned among Jewish people, but almost never outside of a small group of very scholarly rabbis. Even in our present century, the subject is a highly controversial one. I've had the distinction and pleasure of upsetting considerable part of an orthodox Jewish congregation by reference to this subject. They rushed immediately to the rabbi and then a trouble broke. However, in the last 20 years, the entire attitude of the scholarly world has changed. 
Perhaps our increasing interest in psychology had something to do with it. For in Kabbalism we had another one of those archetypal patterns of human ideas which are concerning us more and more. Perhaps also the rise of Zionism had something to do with it. In any event, at the present time, that uh, learned, infallible source of information, the Encyclopedia Britannica, observes that all 19th century and earlier appraisals of Kabbalism must be entirely re-evaluated. By this we mean, and they mean, that the negative position taken earlier is no longer held to be sound. At the present time, at least two groups, one in Germany and one in Israel, are working to restore the neglected fragments of Kabbalistic literature. Manuscripts are being sought out, collected, placed at the disposal of scholars, and the modern tendency is to view the Kabbalah much as the Jewish people have viewed the Dead Sea Scrolls, as a relic of the past that may be of immediate value in solving basic problems not only of Jewish sociology, but of the relationships between the Jewish and non-Jewish worlds.